that uh, secular TV has, as much as uh, you know, one or two are revealing some of what's going on. Uh, we have a, a situation right now that the church needs to address everything the way that God's word said it, not a way, the way that man may uh, presuppose things will work out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna identify to you tonight exactly what scripture says, how close we are only the Lord knows. I'm going to read some newspaper articles that uh, you're aware of. It's going on in the news as I'm speaking right now. As a matter of fact, uh, probably I'm a little bit behind the scene with the newspapers. Uh, The Internet probably has uh, the up-to-date news. But suffice to say, it's exactly uh, what's happening in our world. But I want to take you to Scripture first tonight, and then we'll have prayer later on. Um, I want to take you, if you will, tonight in your Bibles to three scriptures. If somebody were to come to me and say, Pastor, you know, what, what are you sensing uh, God saying right now? What, what is the Holy Spirit saying? Forget about all the newscasters and uh, the politicians and all the prognosticators uh, and uh, the spin doctors. What, what is God saying to you? Let me take you first to uh, 2 Peter chapter number 1. Verse number 19. We're going to start there tonight. I, I don't have it on here because we, uh, well, I'll talk about that. Next week we'll have it up there. But uh, if you look in your Bible tonight to Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19, and we'll start here tonight. If you don't have a Bible, you can look on with somebody. It's important that you see these scriptures. It says, we have a more sure word or a confirmed word of prophecy. I mean, no, God's word is infallible. It's exact. It's perfect. There are no mistakes, no uh, presumptions here. It's perfect. Whereunto you do well that you take heed. Forget about what you're listening to on television, what people are saying, what people are thinking. It's important that we take heed to what God's word says. So he goes on to say, As unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. And of course, the fulfillment of God's prophecy, we know, is that Jesus is returning. That's what we know is going to happen. He goes on to say, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not, and this is most important, in old, I'm sorry, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So understand that these writers of scripture were just penmen. Who inspired the writing of these penmen? The Holy Spirit. God himself told these men to write these things down so that the church would be aware of the time that it would be living in. I want to take you to one uh, verse of scripture in the Old Testament. Zephaniah chapter number 1. Zephaniah chapter number 1, verse number 14. And the reason I want to take you there is because um, what I am sensing in the Holy Spirit in this hour is what Zephaniah prophesied over 2,500 years ago. And that, that, that shows you how exact prophecy is. That the man who wrote this wrote this before the coming of Jesus to earth. And uh, the fulfillment of this, I believe, is is, is close at hand. People say, you know, what hour are we in? What place are we in? And and you're not going to get this from thinking about it. It has to come from the birthing of the Holy Spirit within you. Like a woman, as they say, who gives birth, you know, she, she senses the child is ready to be birthed. And, and, and I am sensing exactly what Zephaniah said. Listen to this verse. He says, the great day of the Lord is near. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near. Twice he repeats that. And hasteth greatly or comes quickly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. Now the rest of this, of course, is the fulfillment, which we have not seen yet, of what we would term the seven year or the great tribulation period. We're not there yet, but the day of the Lord is near. I have no doubt about it that people are, you know, saying, what is going on in our world today? How things literally are 
just uh, all over, uh, upheaval is occurring. Not, not just in the Mideast, it's happening all over the world. It's happening right here now in our country. I don't know if you're aware what's going on in all these different states now, but these things are not something that uh, you know just spontaneously are happening. These things have been prepared before the foundations of the world. Now, of course, we're seeing it being done by men and women, we're seeing it being done by even organizations and groups, but the fact is all of this has been designed by God, and this is our whole, uh, if you want to call it, series that we've been talking about. Everything that is happening, God has already programmed to happen, and what uh, we are now seeing in the events of our world has already gone on in the heavenlies. Remember when we started this whole series? How many know there is a battle that goes on, Daniel's sword, in the heavenlies? The battles go on between the angelic kingdom and the hosts of hell, uh, demonic spirits. This is what the Bible tells us is going to happen, that this battle is going to occur, and there's going to come a time where it says Satan and his demonic hosts are going to be thrown out of the heavenlies, and Satan is going to be thrown down onto this earth. How close we are to that? Well, Zephaniah says we are near, and I believe the prophet here. I sense that in my own spirit. But here's what I want you to be aware of, that you will never understand this unless you are a born-again Christian. No one on TV, no one uh, in the political arena, no one can understand what I'm going to say now unless they have been born again. Because Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot see into the kingdom. So I want to take you to 2 Corinthians and then we'll get into some uh, readings of the news, and then we're going to do some seeing what's happening and what, what's, what it's all about. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. And Paul writes this to the church of Corinth in the area of false prophets or apostles, but uh, I'm going to take it in a completely different uh, text tonight or frame of thinking of the hour that we are living in. It says, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And I want you to underlight that, and I'm going to highlight that as we start tonight off. No marvel, Satan is able to transform himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, the people that he uses, also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So I say all of that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that tonight, those scriptures, to identify, I believe, the present moment that we are living in and really get behind the scenes. What's really going on behind the scenes? Um, the newspapers are, are you know, you, you just can't get enough of this every day. They're talking. But listen to some of these. Some of these are local things also. So listen to this. First of all, blood vow. We all know what's happening here. Um, you and... Uh, uh, Security Council condemns the crackdown that's going on in Libya right now. How many know it seems like nobody has power to stop this uh, situation? And, and, and that's why there's going to be a time, a moment in time, the world is going to beg for somebody to take control. We're, we're getting closer and closer to that hour that... You know, as we see a global society, a new world order, forget about who's involved in this group or that group, even though I could go through the whole groups, that's not important. What we have to understand, the Bible says there will be a new world order. God has, has told us that's going to happen. But in order, again, for this new world leader to be brought on the scene, the world has to be in utter chaos. I don't know about you, but it just seems every day is getting worse and worse. I don't hear any good news. You know, we, we, uh, uh, we, you know, we hear it from our country, understandably so, you know, we oppose what's going on. We, but, but nobody has the power, in other words, to bring all of this uh, into a solution. Can I get you just to move over there, ushers, uh, just on this side? Yeah, everybody on this side. Anybody comes in, just get them over here, please. I appreciate that. So listen to this. Defiant. Muammar Gaddafi vowed to fight to his last drop of blood. We've heard this. And has roared as supporters... Um, uh, and, and, and roared at supporters to strike back against the Libyan protesters, defend his embattled regime yesterday, signaling an escalation of the crackdown that has thrown the capital into scenes of mayhem, wild shooting, 
and bodies in the streets. Okay, this thing is only going to escalate. It's not going to get better. This is not like the uh, um, uh, situation in Egypt. Okay, this dictator is a ruthless dictator, and he means what he says. He will go down as a he think he thinks as a martyr, but the fact is, uh, just like Hitler was was demonized. Remember, men can be demonized. And when men take other innocent victims, their lives like that is going, I believe that they are, if not demonized, at least being influenced by the devil. But right next to this, on a local scene, right here in Massapequa Park, opponents of Representative Peter King's hearings on what he calls the threat of homegrown Islamic terrorism gathered in Massapequa Park yesterday to show support for the Muslims. King's supporters resented the bigotry label and said the hearings are part of the work of the congressman, or, uh, of what the congressman is doing to protect the nation. He's part of the homeland security. And he has the right to investigate, just as we had situations in the past where we had, uh, you know, during the time of World War II with Japan, uh, and they did uh, investigation with uh, the Japanese and so forth, the Nazi party and so forth. And, and what we're trying to do here, understand this, and I, 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 I can see where people may be upset that uh, some people think we're painting the brush with one stroke. It's not about that, okay? It's about protecting our country because I want to tell you, the enemy is already in the country, okay? We are in a place right now where there are, would be, which they've already stopped some of them, terrorists that want to bring down this country. And so it's important for us to understand that this is not going on with any other group. And we're not saying all Muslims or Islamics are part of this group. What we're saying is the Islamics are the only ones that are doing this right now. It's not the Catholics. It's not the Protestants. It's not the Jews. It's not the Mormons. It, 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 it's the Islamic you know, groups that are doing this. So, again, uh, they are now uh, finding that uh, the deception. Here, remember when I said no marvel for Satan is able to transform himself into an angel of light? Here you have all these religious groups. I won't mention names, but one's nun from the Catholic Church says, we don't want to give any assistance to bigotry and persecution. None of you has the faith until you love for, uh, lo until you love for your neighbor what you love for yourself, and that's why we are here. She was protesting King, in other words. A lot of the religious leaders came together to protest what King was doing. But I, but I want you to understand, the turbulence is right here now in this country. Um, I'm not going to get into all the details here. Uh, again, um, unrest sends uh, the oil prices, which we know right now. And, and here's the sick part of all this. And I say sick. Do you realize that our country, if we wanted to, we, we have enough reserves in this country. We could go and, and we have one of the greatest uh, gas reserves. We, we have it all here in our country. But there are people that are fighting this. Why are they fighting this? Why do they want us to be dependent? upon other nations when we can be independent. And so here is the battle that is going on. We're seeing it in a natural realm, but I, what was the original thing that I said to you? The reason that they want to bring down this country is because what this country was represented, what it represents when it was first founded. And how many know this constitution, this country of ours, the founding fathers, based in what we have on our coins, in God we trust. So that's, that's what the real battle is all about. So when you hear about environmentalists and when you hear about this group over here and these activists, understand when you pull back the curtain, forget about the different people, there are only two things going on. Those that are fighting for the angelic hosts of heaven and those that are being influenced by the demonic hosts of hell. It comes down to two people. Forget about the group names. It's only two people. One want to pursue the liberty and the freedom that Christ offers every man. But the fact is, is that there's also the one who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Then on the next page, and I mean, these are just ripped out of the newspaper. I couldn't get enough, and I don't want to spend all night reading newspapers. China tries to head off protests. Now, the reason I'm reading all this is to show you that the Bible, everything that was written in this book years ago, 2,500, 2,000, okay, is exactly what is happening right now. You're going to see how this is going to come to, into play tonight. It says, jittery authorities wary of any domestic dissent staged a show of force yesterday to squelch mysterious online call for Jasmine Revolution. 
And of course, authorities detained activists, increased the number of police on the streets, disconnected cell phone text message services, censored internet postings about the call to stage protests in Beijing, Shanghai, and 11 other major cities. This is China. This is not confined right now to the Middle East. This is going throughout the world. It's coming to this country. It's happening right now. And I'll show it to you in a moment. Um, Libya violence, right, okay. Wisconsin, <laughs> GOP pressures missing Dems to return. Wisconsin Republicans upped the pressure yesterday on Democrats who fled to Illinois. Uh, I'm sorry, who fled to Illinois, yes, to return home and vote on an anti-union bill with the governor calling them obstructionists and a GOP lawmaker threatening to convene without them. Now understand this, I'm not going to get into the... Um, uh, you know, the monetary realm of what's going on, but, but it doesn't take a brain scientist. You don't have to be invested to figure this out. Watch what's happening. The debt of our nation is going through the roof. We don't even know if they're gonna vote yet on the federal uh, uh, budget situation that's going on in March 4th. We have uh, a situation coming, whether you're aware of this, that uh, an Islamic cleric is coming now to this country and they're gonna have a big Islamic demonstration. I mean, everything, it. I, I use the term, and I've used it for years now, the perfect storm. We are in the perfect storm right now. So what you're seeing is when, Wisconsin, Illinois, Ohio, it's going to uh, happen in Boston, New York, California, is that these budgets, understand, state budgets can no longer afford to pay the people in the unions the benefits that they once did. So you have a choice. I was involved with a company many years ago before I was in the ministry. And basically what, it was a uniform company. And the company could no longer continue with the union benefits that they were paying these drivers. And so what occurred was that the owner of the company said to them, we have to make some changes in the package in the perks, in the extras. If we don't, we're going out of business. Now, what happened? The union people went on strike. The drivers went on strike. The owner realized he couldn't continue this way. The strike gave way, and all of a sudden, what happened? The company went bankrupt. It, it just defaulted. If we don't take care of this situation now, you're going to see state after state default, because if you don't have the money, how do you pay your workers? So either we're going to see people say, you know, if we don't sacrifice now, we're going to have nothing later on. And all these drivers that I work with, I was, uh, you know, uh, basically their, their supervisor, all of these drivers, okay, ended up losing their jobs anyway because the company went defunct. And that's what's going to happen in the states. And once the states start to fall, you talk California, New York, m massive you're going to have utter chaos. They're going to pe be people in our world crying. Bring us somebody who can bring us back to the table and bring peace and prosperity. They're going to, they're going to look for anybody. Believe me when I tell you, this is what's happening in our world right now. The Bible predicted all of this. And so uh, this is the most important thing I want to tell you. What I'm going to share with you, it's in the paper. We already know Iran's first attempts in decades to send warships through the Suez Canal. It's already happened towards, in, into Syria, okay? Iran is suspected by the United States and Israel of gearing its nuclear program to develop weapons, which, of course, Tehran denies. Israel considers Iran an existential threat and is watching the warships' movements with growing alarm, Prime Minister Benton, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu accused Iran yesterday of trying to exploit recent instability in Egypt and told his cabinet he views Iran's moves with gravity. And I want to tell you, I know Netanyahu, okay? I've met him before. He is a man who is committed to the safety of Israel. And I will tell you right now, he will not allow these countries to form an association, or I should say, almost a conspiratorial group to attack Israel. He will take the first step. So how close we are to that, only the Lord knows. Uh, I don't have enough time to read all of this stuff. We'll be here all night reading newspaper. But the last one I want to read, the West Bank, an invitation to Hamas. What is Hamas? 
Hamas is a terrorist group, okay? But listen to what it says. The Palestinian prime minister appealed yesterday to the rival Hamas group to join him in a united government offering to allow the Islamic militants to re retain security control of Gaza Strip until the elections later. That's like putting Castro in, the, uh, in, in Washington, D.C. That, 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 that's exactly what it's like. It's saying, come on, come on, Castro, bring your forces over here. We'll put them right in Maryland. That, that, that's what's like having Hamas in your back. It's worse having Hamas. Okay? But, but what I'm trying to say is simply this. We're not getting a fair shake by our own media right now because nobody's really dealing with the issues, okay? The first one that I, I saw that, that brought some eye awakening was last night on uh, the public broadcast network on Channel 13 inside the Egyptian Revolution. And I'll go there in a moment, but before I go there, I want to take you uh, into scripture and, and, and get some clear thought on, on, on this whole issue of what's going on. What is really all of this about? You know, what, what, what's really behind the scenes, the power behind the scenes? Um, uh, is it really about what they're saying, freedom, a democracy? Remember when I say no marvel for Satan is able to transform himself into an angel of light. Uh, what governing agents are going to replace these autocracies and these dictators? Anybody ever think of that? Well, who's going to replace these guys? Um, but anyway, I want to take you to a scripture that I used a long time ago, Genesis chapter 16, 11 and 12. And once you understand this, you'll understand everything that's going on. Remember what I said at the beginning of this? There's only one place you want to look in the last day. Where do you want to look? Israel. Israel. Forget about what's going on around the world. Israel is the key. That is the key to prophecy. Now, at this moment in time, I want to tell you, we don't see it, but on Al Jazeera, which it goes across the Arab world and now across internet to the whole world, clerics are continually saying Israel has to be taken out. Imagine all of a sudden if you had Jewish rabbis or Christian leaders saying, we have to take out all the Islamics. Think, think about what would happen. You already have, now, now look at the delusion, you already have, which I read to you before, Massapequa Park, uh, people from all different walks of life, religious leaders, trying to defend the Islamics, okay? Now at the same time, these Islamic clerics are going across globally saying they want to see the destruction of Israel. Where are the moderate clerics of Islam stepping up to the plate, denouncing just like we denounced that crazy pastor in Florida. Remember that recently, what happened when he, when he came out against, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the gays and so forth like that? We denounced him. But where are the clerics today of Islam coming out denouncing the violence towards Israel? That's what this is all about. It has nothing to do with anything else but Israel. Why does it have only thing, why is it only about Israel? Okay, you, you made a statement, but, but why is this all just a cover for the real thing? Why, why is Israel the, 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 the center of attention for us? What? what? Oh, okay, well, the, the Messiah, yes. Well, Satan knows that if he snuffs out Israel, he proves God's promises. Yeah, the, the whole Bible is a myth. Okay, that's the whole point of everything we've been covering. See, Satan wants to destroy Israel because if he destroys Israel, then God can't fulfill his promises to the people of Israel. That's what this is all about. Now, of course, you're not going to hear this in the educational, the intellectual world. They have no clue at all. You know, they think it's about ideologies. But this is about demons and angels. This is about God and the devil. And, 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 you know, of course, they're going to say, oh, they're lunatics. Well, they know, you know. But, but again, Jesus said that the spiritual-minded man understands all these things. The natural mind can only understand, you know, the natural things of life. But watch this, Genesis 16, 11. It says, And the angel of the Lord said unto Hagar, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. Now watch this. 
and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. Now, understand what is happening right now. Up until just recently even, you will see throughout the entire Islamic world that we do not, we, they do not have the expression of freedom that we have based upon what? The truth of God's word. In other words, people come to this country, they can believe whatever they want. But if we were to go into any country, Saudi Arabia, any country, we would not even be able to tell people about Jesus. We would be considered, you know, uh, under arrest and maybe even uh, taken out. Who knows? <laughs> but, but listen to what this uh, very uh, well-known um, author who was a former general of Saddam Hussein. He wrote a book, and the book he wrote is How an Iraqi General defied and survived Saddam Hussein. His name was General George Sada, S-D-A. Listen to what he writes. Do not think that the Islamic Revolution is a Middle Eastern or European problem. They won't be stopped by appeasement. In other words, there's no talking to these people. They are not interested in political solutions. They don't want welfare. Their animosity is not caused by hunger or poverty. That's what the news is trying to tell us right now. All of this is about hunger and poverty and freedom. Listen to what he says. He knows. He was in it. He says, they understand only one thing, total and complete conquest of the West and anyone who does not bow to their belief system. That's what this is all about. But understand, this is just the camouflage. Remember what I said? No marvel, for Satan is able to transform himself into an angel of light. When people hear the word of religion, they think it's a good thing. But understand, Paul describes to us that if even an angel comes with another word that, you know, is coming forth, that's contrary to the truth of God's word, he says, let that angel be accursed. There is only one truth. Jesus said it. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes under the law. But understand something. The difference between Islam and the difference between truth or the Bible or Christianity. With Christ, people have a choice. Nobody is forced to believe in Jesus. It's a choice that people make. Islam is the religion of submission. And so we're going to look at this carefully tonight because I want you to understand that it is Satan who forces his way. God or Jesus leads. There's a complete different understanding of this. And even in the Islamic community, many who have had conversion experience will tell you that they are completely fed up with having to submit or being overtaken by Others in, in the form of, of course, the clerics in Islam, they, they, they're looking for freedom. And see, that's where some truth exists here. They're looking for freedom, but the only freedom that they're going to really find comes in Christ. Jesus is the only one who offers that kind of freedom. But what I want you to see tonight, and, and, and again, um, I'm going to take you to a scripture so you can see this. Just go to Genesis, if you will, 17, verse 20. Just move over one chapter. The whole battle here is simply this. Uh, it has nothing to do with political dominance or even um, the perceived oppression of the Palestinians. I want to tell you, this perceived oppression of the Palestinians is being used, again, by the news to promote, again, the idea that Israel is the aggressor nation. Israel is the tyrant. I want to tell you, the Bible says in the last days, men will call things right that are wrong and things wrong that are right. And, and the scary part for our country right now, America, is that we have been somewhat no longer uh, backing uh, Israel, and we have basically told them, listen, you can't build certain settlements in your land. And I want to tell you something. Could you imagine somebody coming here and saying, you can't build your house as an American on Long Island? How long would that last? Okay, so what I'm saying to everybody tonight is simply this. This is not about anything else but truth versus that which is not truth. The Bible versus the Quran. In the Bible, Israel is God's timepiece. In the Quran, 
it is the either dominance or the conquering of the infidels that brings about the fulfillment of Islamic prophecy. Now watch this carefully because it's described here. And as for Ishmael, verse 20, I have heard thee. Of course, God's speaking to Hagar here. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant, and I want you to see this, but my promise, my agreement will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. Now understand clearly the Father Abraham had two different children by two different women. One, of course, was his wife, and, she had, and they had Isaac. That is the child of promise. That's where we have the lineage of the Jewish or the Hebrew people. When Abraham first uh, had his first son, it was Ishmael. And the reason was basically because of he and Sarah thought that uh, God was basically taking too long. <laughs> with the promise, and, and, and they hastened the hand of God, or they, they, they basically dismissed the hand of God. And of course, that's where we see the formation of, uh, of Ishmael between Abraham and Hagar. Now here is what we have to be aware of. The Bible says there would always be animosity or enmity between the children of Isaac and the children of Ishmael. This has gone down since the beginning of time with Abraham and his two ch children. Basically, his, his uh, the, the two brothers who were, you know, uh, from two different mothers, the same father. That's what the battle has been. Now, I finally got some truth, or at least insight. I won't say truth because I don't know if it's true or not. But insight, last night, watching, which I told you, the public broadcast. Anybody see the public broadcasting last night on Channel 13? Okay. Let me tell you what it was about so you have some understanding. That this is not coming from the past or even the word of God. This is coming from the local's mouth, okay? And, and just follow me now. They take you the first half of the program. It's an hour program. The first half inside the revolution, how this whole thing began. And basically, from what they were showing, it was a secular group of students that had come together that said, you know, we've had enough of this tyranny for 30 years. And so what they did was, through the internet and the Facebook and all that other stuff, and, 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 and believe me, this was planned among many, many uh, people. It wasn't just a small group. And so they formulated, and they, they didn't know how many people were going to get out and start marching, but once the ball got going and they started to march on the streets, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And th th they were interviewing the head of, basically, the head two guys who started this, these, these two young men. And one was very savvy when it came to the internet. He had a real uh, uh, influence through Facebook and so forth, how to get it out. They didn't know how this thing was going to come out, but it just grew and grew. Little did they know. But what happened was it became, or it, the issue became is when the police who were on the side of Mubarak took to the streets. And at that point, the revolution or the insurrection switched hands. And that's where the Muslim Brotherhood came in. See, the Muslim Brotherhood is a group that basically does a lot of good things for the people there. Now, now remember I said, no marvel for Satan is able to transform himself into an angel of light. I want you to keep this on your mind. What do they provide for people? They provide medical assistance. They provide food for people, the poor people. Uh, you know, all the things that we look for in our social systems here, uh, they provide for the people. But, on the other hand, even within the Muslim Brotherhood, you have two different factions. You have the older faction, meaning the older age group, and you have the younger faction. The younger faction is the ones that basically came alongside of these secular students and said, we're going to help you uh, face this, uh, you know, um, whole political uh, you know, dynasty that, that you're facing and the police and everything else. What, what took place was really a transfer of power due to one fact. 
the, the, the unified or the unity that the Muslim Brotherhood that exists. It is on, the only, uh, it's the largest and the only uh, group that could carry this kind of a, a revolution to where it went to. As a matter of fact, they became the security for all the people in the country at that point. But here's where the factions differed. Within the Muslim Brotherhood, the older ones basically told it the way that they believe that they are looking for a caliphate, which means they want Islamic Sharia law. They want the state to become like it is in Iran and any other state where Islam controls the country. The younger ones um, are, are somewhat divided. I don't know because they didn't really get into the issues, but they seem to be a little bit more liberal in this area. What they're looking for is, uh, you know, to, to get this guy out of office. That's, that's the bottom line. Who controls eventually, only God knows. But the whole program came down to these last uh, few minutes. And this is where my, my antennas really went up. They took the young man who's in control basically of the um, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, the young guy, and they asked him this question. They said, well, what about the agreement that Egypt has with Israel right now, their peace agreement? Are you going to maintain that once Mubarak is out? Now, he gave first what we call a political answer. He said, if the people want us to keep the peace agreement with Israel, we'll keep the peace agreement with Israel. But if they don't want us to, then we're going to respond to what the people want. But then he, th this news broadcast it got right to the point. He said, do you, as the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, acknowledge the right for Israel to exist. That put the tire to the road. Here was his answer. He said, let me ask you, if somebody came in and stole your house and your property, would you feel the right to go and recapture that property from that person who stole it from you? What he was basically saying, Israel stole that property and we're going to go back and we're going to regain it from Israel's hands. And that is, listen to me, that is the, the mind of the Islamic community. Okay, understand this clearly. They do not believe that Israel has the right to that property. But what is the real battle over? Remember what I said behind the scenes? Is God's word the truth or is the Quran the truth? Let's take a look, and we'll, we'll find out. Let's go to, um, if you will, Isaiah 54, 17. Isaiah 54. The moment that God made a covenant agreement with Abraham to the present, Israel has been on Satan's hit list. Remember what we saw what happened when you look at the Bible? As soon as we see the children of Israel... Uh, under uh, the oppression of Egypt, what, is, what does Pharaoh want to do? He wants to destroy all of the males. Then we see later on uh, in the situation where Haman comes along, what does he want to do? Exterminate the Jewish people. What do we see with Hitler? He wants to exterminate the Jewish people. What do we see with Saddam Hussein? He wants to exterminate the... What do we see with the Hamas? They want to exterminate the Jewish people. What do we see with Hezbollah? They want to exterminate... Now... Think about this. You have a little over 6 million people in Israel today. 300 million Islamic people surround Israel. The extremists have one thought in mind. Push the people of Israel out into the Mediterranean Sea. This is what they've tried to do from the beginning, which we talked about, of Israel in 1948. They've been through four major wars. Every one, Israel has won. Now, you know what they say, the winner keeps all. Yet, Israel has given back property after property due to pressure, due to pressure from the United States. Supposedly, their best friend. What kind of friend, you know, are we? That's the question right now. This is the thing that concerns my heart right now. Are we still Israel's friend, or is this only in name only? Isn't it amazing that our president, and I'm not here talking against him or uh, our government, but isn't it 
amazing today. I was watching the news. He didn't mention the name Gaddafi once. I, I, I don't get it. I, I really don't understand that this guy is a major, I hate to say it, uh, delusional nut job who, I'm, I'm talking about Gaddafi, he, he, and, and who, who, who's brought terror. Many believe, you know, he blew up the, um, the plane. The plane. Uh, I forget the, na the, 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 the number on it. But, but what was that? Okay, the Pan Am plane. You know, it, it's a known fact. But, but the point I'm trying to say is it took, it took our administration basically uh, almost a week and a half to address this whole situation. Even in Iran right now. If anybody should have got on board, we should have gotten on board and been behind these Iranian people to overthrow that nut job. You know, Ahmadinejad. I mean, think about what, what's happening. Where do we stand as a country anymore? Where is our integrity? Who is our friend and who is our enemy? But, but anyway, I don't want to get carried away here. I'll get too political. Listen, Isaiah 54, 17 and I want you to write this down because this is not in regard to the church. This is in regard to Israel. Okay, we use this for the church many times, but it's really literally in regard for Israel. It says, no weapon formed against thee will prosper. And I don't care how many people surround Israel and how many militants come against them. The simple fact is this. God is going to be their protector, not the United States. So I don't want anybody to get upset if we seem to be switching allegiance and we don't back Israel the way that we should. The only, the only thing sad for America is that our hedge is gone once we don't back Israel. And then, then we're open to any kind of attack. That means the terrorists could uh, literally uh, have a, a field day here in America because God's not going to protect us any longer once we turn our back on Israel. Now, the reason I say this is to awaken, hopefully, uh, the church to realize our, our position of prayer, that we need to really pray for our administration. The Bible says pray for our leaders. I don't care. Forget the name, the personality, uh, Democrat, Republican. It doesn't matter. We need to pray for divine wisdom that these men will respond in women, not to the opinions of people, but clearly to divine uh, direction. And, and the providence that God has. And so we need to pray. I don't care whether you like people, don't like people. We need to stand together as the church and pray like we've never prayed before for the authorities and those that are in leadership of this country. But I want you to see this clearly, the significance of, of Israel's reemergence in, in their you know, uh, uh, ancient homeland is really what I call the final countdown. This is the whole purpose of why we've been covering this and staying here for this. See, 1948, we know the countdown started. But how, see, the question many people, how close are we? I'm going to tell you we're at the door. And I'm going to show you why because of what Jesus said. Listen to what he said. Turn in your Bibles to, to Matthew 24, verses 32. And, and, and this is so clear. I mean, it, you know, I use the term again, the, the perfect storm. But uh, if this isn't it, then uh, somebody better ring my bell real loud because I've, I've missed it. But I mean, I'm an observer of our, our world around us. And all I have to do is look at the Bible and then look around and say, wow, this matches up. I mean, you, you know, I don't understand even sometimes teachers and preachers when it comes to uh, teaching and preaching on prophecy. Well, you know, I don't teach it because it's difficult to understand. It's right in the Bible. All you have to do is look at it. And then people say, well, you know, how do you connect the dots? Well, you read the Bible, and then you look at the signs, and Jesus said, when you see all these signs begin to happen, look up. Your redemption draweth near. I mean, it doesn't take a brain scientist to figure that out. Watch this. So likewise, Jesus said, when you shall see all these things. We're going to look at this just for a moment, what all these things are. But notice what he says. Know that it, I'm sorry, I got verse 32 first. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. Let's make it simple for our audience that's maybe watching on uh, Facebook or whatever they're watching on uh, YouTube. Um, the Bible is clear. What does the fig tree always, uh, figurative, what is the type? What is, what is, if somebody said, what's the fig tree in the Bible? What is the fig tree? 
Okay, how do we know that? Just for our audience that may be watching, all you have to do is go to the Old Testament. Hosea chapter 9, verse 10. It says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time. Of course, there are other scriptures in the Old Testament. But Israel is the fig tree. So watch what Jesus is saying. Now, learn a parable of the fig tree or of Israel. When his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Okay, so we know Israel was formed as a nation in 1948. So likewise, in verse 33, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near. Remember when I start with Zephaniah tonight, chapter 1, verse 14, and I said, he said, it is near, it is now, listen to what Jesus says, it is near even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall, what? Not pass until all these things be fulfilled, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So let's look clearly at what Jesus means by all these things. And let's just look at our world. Jesus predicted certain things when all of these things happen at the same time. He said, we're right at the door. What did he say? First of all, that men's hearts would wax cold. The coldness of people's hearts. Secondly, he talked about uh, the uh, increase of iniquity, that sin would prevail at a higher degree than ever. I mean, I was just telling somebody the other day, or maybe it was even today, I said, oh, I was talking to somebody on the phone, and it just happened to be an agent, not even probably a believer, and, and she started telling me, she said, you know, I can't believe where we once were, Lassie, Father knows best. I said, you know, you could come and preach for me tonight. I, I, I mean, think about where we were and where we are today. Don't tell me that iniquity hasn't increased. You know, when you look at television today, you know, I, I have to tell you as a pastor, uh, I watch TV like some of you. And sometimes there's something I like to see or whatever. But, you know, I'm starting to see even the programs that once in a while I like, they always have to throw in some form of filth. They can't, they can't just let one program go by. It's got a good you know, plot to it. They got great acting. They always have to throw something in there that taints, uh, you know, your, your, your conscience. You know what I mean? Like, like you, you watch it right till the end, and I can't believe they just threw that in there. Like, where did that come from? And, and, and that's the world that we are living in. So if you were sitting there with your daughter or your son up to that point, everything was fine. And then the last night, oh my God, don't watch that. That's the world that we are living in. How many know our parents never had that problem? You could sit through every program with them, even the commercials. I can't even watch the commercials with my kids. Okay, so you have the coldness of the heart. Remember when people watched one another on the block? They took care of one another. They respect for all adults, not only your parents, but everybody else. And if somebody yelled at you, you deserved it, and you, you, you go home to your parent, and God forbid you told them that someone was yelling at you, believe me, you get a beating again. Okay, so, okay, different world, right? Then, th then you have the increase, of course, which I said, iniquity of sin. Then, what do we have? I mean, we do, we've been seeing it all over, the rise of the earth in all the different forms of nature that's happening. Earthquake, just big one recently, New Zealand. But I mean, it's been happening, Haiti. You know, just, just around, these are just signs. The Lord said, when you see these signs. Then you have wars and rumors of wars. Well, look, look at our world right now. I mean, it's happening all over the world. I mean, look at the streets, even in Greece today. Did you see what went on in, oh my gosh. It was like, it was like, like watching, a, a, again, revolution, again and again. And this is happening on ev on every, in every part of the world right now that we're living in. I mean, it's embarrassing. You look on the news and you see, like, our country and these people. It, it almost reminds me when I was back in college and we, we, we took over the, the chapel at St. John's University. It was during the, the Kent time where they killed those four students in Kent. And it was, a, 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 you know, a, an uprising of all students. We're, we're reliving this again. But this has much more, um, you know, uh, future consequences to it than what happened during the Vietnam War. This is, this is much bigger than that. Um, but anyway, then you have um, the uh, economic conditions or the woes uh, of, of what's going on, the global, uh, you know, this, this whole global thing, it, it, it's, <laughs> I hate to say it, but you know, people are out there, you know, what should I do? Should I buy gold? Should I buy Kamash? Should I buy, listen, 
The important thing for us to understand, the Lord said these things are going to happen. I believe that God is the supplier of all our needs. And I tell Christians that if we're not faithful, if we're not faithful, then we have a problem. Then we have to depend upon ourselves. But if we're faithful to what God says, how many know God will take care of us? How many know I'd rather have God than having uh, the, the, the world uh, watching? You Listen, you, you can pack all the food you want in your backyard. It doesn't matter, okay? Uh, because guess what? You have insurrection. People will come and they'll uh, take it. But how many know if you've got God standing at your front door, it's a much greater thing, okay? So... And, and, and then when you look at our world, it's filled with pe all kinds of pestilence. I'm not going to get into it, but you know it's there. Uh, medical science hasn't been able to respond to half of the pestilence that we're dealing with. So what Jesus said, he says, when you see all these things, along with what? The budding of the fig tree, the beginning of what? Prophecy start to go into the countdown form, Israel. Then you see all these other things. Uh, again, it's the final countdown. Some, like I say, may see it as the perfect storm, but we're living in that moment right now in time. This is the moment that God, you know, what, what a lot of people are sitting back with their head in the sand, they're saying, ah, maybe this will all just pan out. That's what people think. They live in denial. You know, it's, it's like, did you ever watch the when they say, and there will be a northeaster coming up the coast? And, 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 you know, they, they say it came in from the Bahamas. It's working. It's going to work its way up from Florida and then into the Carolina. But in your own mind, you think, ah, maybe it'll just go out to sea by the time it gets to me. Remember what I said at the beginning of the year? Prepare for the worst, but our hope is for the best. Jesus is coming for his church. How many believe that? Uh, how much, you know, we experience, like I said, in the beginning of sorrows, only God knows. I'm not here. I'm not going to get into that subject tonight of tribulation and where the church is going to be. All I know is this. Be in Christ. That's the most important thing. Be in Christ. And as Noah, you know, he made it out before what judgment came. As, 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 as Lot was taken out of Sodom and Gomorrah before judgment came, I believe God's going to have his hand on the church no matter what happens. I believe that with all my heart. God is a protector of his people. He says, we are not born unto his, what, wrath. How many know wrath and anger is coming from God to those that don't believe? So let me, uh, gee, I, don't, I can't believe how quickly we go here all the time. Let, let me just close with this tonight. Let's just start this. I'm not going to be able to get into, well, let's forget this for a moment. Let's go to this. Because I know some of you were looking at this. What, what is this all about here? That I, that I wrote. Okay. Bottom line is we have been talking about the person of Jesus. This group over here, the Islamics, believe in Jesus also. As a matter of fact, the Quran says he is the sinless prophet. They don't believe he's God, but they believe he is the sinless prophet. In Islam, you basically have two groups. The Shiites and the Sunnis. The Shiites believe in the return of the 12th Iman. The Sunnis call him the Mahdi. But basically, they're the same Jesus. So when people say, well, you know, what do you have in common? Okay, we have in common the name at least. Jesus, 12th Iman, Mahdi. Now, when you look at the Bible, we know the Antichrist comes, that global leader, and what does he do? In the, at the three and a half year period, he goes and he kills the Jewish people and the Christians. The 12th Iman also kills Jews and Christians. In the Bible, you have the Antichrist, and when he comes, that globally, he's going to create a seven year peace agreement in the Mideast and be Israel's protector, or seemingly be Israel's protector. The Iman rules for seven years and also brings peace into the Mideast with Israel. The Antichrist, of course, in the middle of the tribulation period, three and a half years in, goes to the Temple Mount, goes into the temple, which will be rebuilt, and the Bible says he will sacrifice an unclean animal. The people will realize, they have, the Jewish people realize he is not the one that they're looking for, the Messiah. The Iman, he also goes to the Temple Mount, and he also desecrates the Temple. 
the Antichrist goes now and he begins to behead. He uses, that, that's, the Bible, that's the word in the Bible. He starts to behead. Remember the guillotine? He beheads the believer. Well, the iman does the same thing. He beheads the believer. You get down to this part here, and I'm doing this real quick. We'll spend more time maybe next week on all of this. The mark of the beast. We know what the Bible says in Revelation 13. Anyone who does not have the mark of the beast will not be able to buy or sell. We know as Christians that the mark of the beast comes so the Antichrist can control and, and uh, dominate the world. A little bit different. They also believe in the mark of the beast. But the mark of the beast that they believe in are the chosen ones. The chosen ones. Okay? Bottom line, and here's where it'll capture your attention. Jesus returns on both ends. When Jesus returns in the book of Revelation, he's coming, the Bible said, with a sword out of his mouth to destroy those in the place of Armageddon. But the simple thing is all those who believe in him, of course, the Bible says are going to return with him. That's in the book of Jude also. When Jesus returns with the um, twelfth iman or the Mahdi, he comes, but he tells all the people that are not Islam that he never died on the cross. And that, um, only, and that they've been fooled that only those that believe as the Islamic way teaches is the truth. That the Bible, again, is a myth. It's a lie. That's, that's the difference. The chosen ones are, 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 are the Islamics. The, 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 right. But, but understand, remember what I told to you tonight? That there was a reason why I had you go to Corinthians. No marvel, for Satan is able to transform himself into what? An angel of light. And so he will use these clerics or ministers, again, as ministers of, of, of you know, uh, what they believe is, is truth. Now, when we get down to this, the reason I shared all this, I mean, I saw it, uh, you know, put out by this fellow who wrote a book called The uh, Islamic Antichrist. But the reason I'm sharing all of this with you, and, and this is why it's so important. Remember when I told you at the beginning of the night, those two warships that went from Iran through the Suez Canal into Syria. Uh, I, I didn't hear the exact thing, or I couldn't remember the exact thing that Am uh, Ahmadinejad said, but he said everything is, is, is starting to, to go the way of the bringing of the 12th Iman. What has to happen for the 12th Iman, or, of course, uh, the Mahdi, to come? Chaos and crisis. Let me ask you a question. You, you don't have to answer it tonight. We'll talk more about it next week, because who knows what will be by next week. Um, do you think that all of this is a coincidence, that all of these actions are happening now throughout the world, not just in the Mideast, North Africa, China's going on, we've got problems here in our country, and this is happening all over the world right now. Is it, is it just, or is it possibly, again, an opportunity where um, somebody like Ahmadinejad, who believes in this 12th Iman, and here's what he said, and I, I just want to quote this so, so you can uh, hear this. He, he, he prayed this at the United Security Council by saying, I pray to you to hasten the emergence of the promised one, the one that will uh, f uh, fill, uh, fill this world with justice and peace. Now, he believes he can hasten the coming of the 12th month, just like people thought they could hasten the coming of Jesus. You know, if we can make Je the world ready for Jesus and win Jesus, you know, win people to the Lord that we're going to hasten Jesus. Nobody's going to hasten Jesus' return. He says, no man knows the hour of the day. He's going to come when his father says, it's time to go. But the point is, this guy in Iran really believes he can hasten the coming of the 12th month be by creating world crisis and chaos. What is happening? Here's my, and, and again, this you don't take to the bank. It's not in the Bible. Here's my personal opinion. As I'm watching things, just like you. Right now, he knows, he knows, the United States is not showing great favor towards Israel. He knows that they are not the ally that they once were to Israel. And so he is exploiting this moment in time. Now, why does he want to exploit it? Watch what happens. If he can somehow irritate 
Israel enough, knowing that Netanyahu is in there right now. All that has to happen is, is Netanyahu says, you know what, we've had enough, let's go to take the ship out or whatever it may be. In other words, they respond first. Watch what'll happen. All of the nations of the world will turn against Israel as the aggressor nation. Where we end up, only God knows as a country. Thank God we opened up our mouth just recently in that UN meeting and so forth, but it doesn't matter because we still denounce their settlements, okay? So we put ourselves on, on, on the wrong side. But the point I'm trying to bring out is simply this. It only takes one provocation and then a response. How much, and here's, how much restraint can Israel and the prime minister continue to have in face of being surrounded right now with instability because they don't know. See, what they knew was Mubarak and other dictators, uh, basically Egypt, kept the peace with Israel. They don't know what's going to happen when these new revolutionaries, even through their you know, uh, process of what they call democracy, who's going to take office there and what the response is going to be. They don't know how strong the Muslim Brotherhood is going to influence the governments. Now, if you look at the paper, and I, I think I had it before somewhere, one of these papers, uh, just to give you an idea. Let me see if I got another one here. Well, I don't have it here, but... Uh, if, if you looked at Israel, Israel will say is like at the center right here. All of these countries right now are having insurrection. Now, there's one big country over here that hasn't started yet, but it could happen tomorrow. It's called Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Saudi Arabia, of course, uh, will have a tremendous effect on us because of the oil and so forth. But the point I'm saying is if Saudi Arabia goes to that, now every country surrounding Israel... Over here you have Egypt, right next to, uh, you have Jordan that's having problems right now. Then you have Iran back here. You have Baran down here. You have um, uh, Libya over here. I mean, every place you look, Israel is surrounded with what? Instability. Now you have Iran going through the Suez Canal into Syria. Then they have what? Now the militants that are in what? Gaza, the Hamas, right in their own borders. I mean, they're in their backyard. So how much could you, think about the United States, how much could we take if all of a sudden we were surrounded, let's just say surrounded by nations, let's say Canada, Mexico, South America, everybody was our enemy and they were looking to destroy us. And all of a sudden, you know, part of our country, we gave back, let's say, to the Indians and they became part of that group that hates us, that, that's what I'm trying to say. They are surrounded right now. And, 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 you know, people think it can't happen, but it only takes one missile. That's all it takes, one missile. All you do is study history. Look at World War I. It just took one shot, and we had World War I. And so what I'm saying is this. Because we are living in such a time and so close, I believe that we have one responsibility. And that responsibility simply is, is to be people who are on fire. We, we can't settle for, for lukewarmness. We can't settle for like, you know, a relaxed or comfortable Christianity. We have to be on fire Christians in this hour. We have to tell people the truth, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And, and you know what? Once we tell them, we have to trust the Holy Spirit to do the rest of the work. We have to begin to really see that, you know what? Wouldn't the saddest thing in the world be the rapture takes place and we said, you know, I should have told my cousin. I should have told my friend. It, it's too late. You know, you, you read the story of Lazarus. He couldn't come back, you know. The, the, the rich man, he said, you know, go, could you just send Lazarus back and tell my family? It's going to be too late. Once that rapture happens, and listen, I'm not going to debate with the Christian church on when we're going up. That's nonsense. That's what the devil would have us to do. I don't care when we go up. All I want to know is, is that we're going, Okay. And, 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 you know, if, if, if sometimes you get so caught up in that, you know, that's how the devil diverts you into the main thing. That's a minor issue. The major issue, are we winning people for the Lord? And, and, and so I just want to encourage you. This is an hour to pray. 
But I want to tell you, this is what I believe the Lord says. We can work while it's still light. When it's darkness, we can't work anymore. It, this is no, uh, you know, as they say, joke right now. We are in, and, and, and you know, I was going to give you a word tonight from Jeremiah and from Ezekiel about the watchman. Because I believe every pastor, every man who is called by God or woman called by God is called to be a watchman on the wall. And I'm going to tell you, one day these watchmen are going to have to stand before God, the Bible says. And he says, if you don't warn the people, the blood will be on your hands. And I want to tell you, uh, and, and, and it's just a word of caution, that you need to pray for the watchmen. You need to pray for those that are called to the ministry. Because I want to tell you, if the preachers don't start waking up to the hour that we are living in, I'm going to tell you, they're going to have to give an account to God when they stand there one day. This is an hour, like I said, where it says, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm. This, this, is, this is not something where, oh, you know, we've heard about the Lord coming back. Listen, every sign is here now. Now. And, and, and like I said, I told people, remember, prepare for the worst, hope for the best. If God gives a reprieve, like he did to Nineveh, remember when God gave a reprieve? So be it, and let's just enjoy that reprieve while it lasts. But if that reprieve doesn't come, I want to tell you something. This is the hour to turn up the fire. Turn on the offense. Listen, it's time to really pray like we've never prayed before. It's a time to share off. I was telling my wife before church, I said, you'd almost have to be uh, biblically uh, brain dead or have your head in the sand, not be able to, to share with people today looking at the world. It, it, it's so easy. People uh, that you would never meet, all you start to do, you hear it all over. Every place I go, people are talking about this, talking about that. And it, it, it's almost like they're inviting us. Tell us. Somebody give us an answer. What's going on? And you know what? I don't have to say I know what's going on. Here's what the Bible said 2,500 years ago. They knew. And they're exact in what they said. So, uh, again, I went over a little bit tonight, but I'm not going to apologize. Because I really believe that, that we need to really have that uh, fire back in us uh, for, for telling people about Jesus. So, uh, again, um, we're going to pray tonight. We're going to ask the Lord to really um, fill us with his Holy Spirit because I think that's what we need. The church needs a real filling of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says you're not going to speak. I'm going to speak through you. People often say, you know, uh, I don't, I'm not good at witnessing. Listen, you don't have to be good at witnessing. Forget about what you can do and what you can say. When you just surrender your life to Christ, he's going to open up doors for you, and he will speak through you. But you have to be obedient and say, okay, Lord, whatever you tell me to do, that's what I'm going to do. Whatever you tell me to say, that's what I'm going to say. And you know what? You'll be surprised how many people are hungering right now for, for a, a sure word, a confirmed word. And there's only one thing that doesn't change, and that's the truth. Everything else is a lie. Everything else is a delusion. Everything else is deception. But how many know the truth stands forever? Let's pray tonight. Let's ask God to help us. Father, I pray tonight for the church. Lord, allow your people to awaken that, Lord, we cannot live with our, hand, our heads in the sand. We cannot live in denial. This is not a time to bring fear to the masses. This is a time to bring hope to the masses. Help us, Lord, to have that word in season. Let us understand, all of us tonight, that we are responsible for the people that you put around us, for the sphere of influence that we have, our family, our friends, the people we come in contact with, we work with. Lord, we're not looking again for the Antichrist. We are looking for your return. Help us, Lord, to be encouraged in this hour that you said when we see all of these things take place, know that our redemption draws near. Help us, Lord, to have a burden to bring some folks on board with us when we leave this planet called Earth. I pray tonight that each person here would be open to the leading of your Holy Spirit. That, Lord, these can be the most exciting times of our faith. That we have to take, as you said, the offensive. The kingdom of God suffereth violence, and the violent seize it or take it by force. We have to realize that our daughters, our sons, our parents, the people you put around us, Lord, the enemy ta has taken control of their hearts and their minds. They are influenced by the enemy. Help us, Lord, to see 
the importance of our responsibility, that as we plant the seeds, as we water the seeds, that, Lord, you bring in the harvest. Help us to be people, O oh God, of effectiveness in this hour, people who will influence others, people that will not be ashamed to tell the truth. And, Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I, I don't know if you caught this the other day, and I, I don't want to you know, stay on this point too long. But, you know, Glenn Beck, when he was sharing something on TV, said, you know, I, I, years ago, a couple years back, I tried to get in touch with Billy Graham. And he said, uh, I couldn't get in touch with him. He said, but just recently, the door opened for me. And he said, I was only supposed to spend an hour with Billy Graham, but I spent three hours with Billy Graham. Forget about, you know, like I said, the person. But see, even, even a guy like Glenn Beck, who's exposed a lot of the politics that's going on, who's exposed a lot of the stuff behind the scenes, he's looking for someone who has a little bit more insight to what's really happening in our world. Now, he didn't run, listen to me, even though he may be Mormon in name, he didn't run to the head of the Mormon church. I want you to understand this. He ran to a very well-known, in our century, one of the most well-known Christians of all times, Billy Graham. And I believe, I believe with all my heart, that even though uh, a Glenn Beck maybe does not have the complete revelation as we do as, as born-again believers, he is really seeking for the, for, the, for the truth and the answer to what is happening in the world. And I want to tell you something. It all is what you've been having since last June. It's all written in the book. And uh, I just want to tell you, the, the only thing I disagree with with Glenn Beck that I've heard recently and I just say this so you understand scripturally why I say he doesn't have the full revelation yet, is because at the end of the program, after meeting with Billy Graham, he said, you know, that basically uh, I believe people are good. And, and I have to tell you, that's the only place I disagree because the Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked, and who knows? The only way a person has a heart transplant is once they come to Christ. Then the Bible says that person. But, but, but basically the planet isn't good. The, the, the devil is the god or the prince of this world. And so I want you to understand that uh, uh, when you come to the full grasp that this is not about politics or groups of people. This is a spiritual battle that's going on. There's only two groups of people, the believer and the unbeliever. That's what it comes down to. And that's how it's going to be left at the very end. When, when the wrath of God comes, it's going to come down on the unbeliever. That's what the Bible says. And so uh, be, again, encouraged. that Don't get so caught up in what you're hearing, even like I said, on television, that you lose sight of the most important thing, and that's this word. That's why I started with you tonight. We have a sure word, the word of prophecy. Where do I think we are? What Zephaniah said, we're near. We're not there yet, but we're near. But more importantly, what I read to you from Corinthians, the most important thing, no marvel for Satan is able to transform himself as an angel of light. What that means in modern day terms, there is no spin doctor like Satan. He can spin anything on everybody. And if you watch these different people on TV and they, they tell you all these things and it sounds good and we want democracy and we want... Don't be fooled by what you're hearing. Because understand, the enemy knows how to make, you know, light out of darkness. Okay, so, so just stay with God, stay with his word, but more importantly, see your responsibility. All we have our responsibility is the last commission that God gave. Our commander-in-chief said, go ye into all the world, make disciples. Start where? Start with your family. Start to pray for them every night. When the opportunity comes, make invitation. Remember I did about a week ago or two, I said, everybody, I'm going to let you 30 years do something I've never done. My wife thought it was nuts. She said, I can't believe you told everybody to take out their cell phones. But it wasn't so nuts when people came the week after and got saved in church. How many know that God, his ways are far beyond, you know. And so I, I may be more aggressive in the weeks to come. But if my aggression is for the kingdom of God, I don't think God's going to hold me in, in, in a negative way. But, but I believe this is the opportunity. We have to push ourselves. The Bible says provoke one another to good works and to love. And if I can provoke people here to share their faith a little bit more, pray a little bit more, how many know we're going to see greater results? So keep praying for your pastor that God will give me the strength and the wisdom. Amen? And, and not to get on the wrong side of my wife either. <laughs>